Oh, so I am Dr. Laura Donovan. I'm a neuro-oncologist at Columbia and also uh, in New York City, uh, and also work as a neuro-oncologist in the VA system um, in New York, in the Bronx. Um, and my research interest is primarily in uh, interventions, finding interventions to improve quality of life in people living, for people living with brain tumors right. and their caregivers and loved ones. So very excited to speak with all of you today. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about mindfulness, which is an area of interest of mine, um, stress and the body, and a little bit of how this may be helpful for people living with brain tumors and their loved ones. Um, all right, let's share the screen. All right, can you see my screen? Yeah, yes. that's great. Perfect. All right. So, um, so let's get started. So I have no disclosures. And, and, sorry. Okay. <laughs> and just uh, this is just a brief outline of what we'll be doing. I feel like I'm echoing. Um, let's see if I can fix that. Um, all right. So. Just to start off, I don't need to belabor this point as I feel you all can tell me more about this than I can tell you about this and would love to hear from you about your experiences. Um, but we know that living with a brain tumor or caring for somebody with a brain tumor can be stressful. Get it turned off. Uh, <laughs> brain tumors are unique in that people who have them are dealing with both a cancer and a neurological disease that impacts many aspects of their functioning. Um, we've seen in multiple studies that people living with brain tumors report many symptoms, um, fatigue and distress being two of the most common, but oftentimes people have multiple symptoms. Um, in one survey study, they found that over 50% of respondents had 10 or more symptoms at one time. Um, we know that stress, um, can lead to things like anxiety, depression, can lead to people having a lower quality of life. Um, and there, while there has been an increasing body of literature looking at some of the symptoms and some of the stressors that people with brain tumors and their caregivers have, um, there have not been many studies specific to this population that focus on the best ways to alleviate these symptoms or to improve quality of life. And this is different than in some other types of cancer, um, breast cancer being the most notable one where there really is quite a large body of literature on um, different techniques and um, for different symptoms. Um, all right. So let's talk for a little bit about what happens to our bodies under stress. Um, so there's stress response is a biological response that's hardwired, um, mostly out of our conscious control. And it was really designed to protect us from external threats. So this over here, this is a bear that was in my sister's yard a few weeks ago. Um, so when your body is presented with a threat, um, there are three main systems that become activated. And we'll talk about each of these in a little bit more detail, but there's the limbic system, which sort of generates the stress response in the brain, and then it activates the autonomic nervous system and the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Um, the main driver of the stress response is a structure in the limbic system called the amygdala. And this is also known as the fear center of the brain. Um, and so basically the stress response, it activates three main systems um, in the brain and in the body. So you have the limbic system, which is a set of deep structures in the brain that really regulate emotion and behavior. And the key structure in the limbic system that really turns on the stress response is the amygdala, otherwise known as the fear center of the brain. Um, and when the amygdala is triggered, it sends signals to the hypothalamus, which is sort of a master regulator structure in the brain, 
Um, and that does two things. It activates your autonomic nervous system, which is your fight or flight response. And it also activates um, this hypothalamic pituitary axis, which is a neuroendocrine response that ultimately um, secretes a hormone known as cortisol, which is a steroid in your body. And what that does is that maintains the stress response. Um, one moment. Sorry, I'm in my office. We're knocking. Um, okay, so this is a good example of the stress response being activated. <laughs> um, so anyway. Um, yes, so your autonomic nervous system, that is your flight or fight response. Um, your sympathetic nervous system, um, it's driven by adrenaline, otherwise known as epinephrine, um, and norepinephrine, which is another hormone that acts similarly. And what it does is it revs your body up to fight or flight. Um, it increases your heart rate, it dilates your pupils so you can see better, it prevents digestion so your blood can go to your muscles instead of to your stomach. I and mean, then it really prepares the body for action. So while all that is happening, you also have, like I said, this um, neuroendocrine axis or the hypothalamic pituitary axis. And what's, what that's doing is it's causing your body to secrete cortisol, which is the stress hormone that kind of maintains your body in a state of arousal. Um, and, you know, in the case of something like a bear, this is actually a really good system, right? You see the threat, your body reacts before your brain has even really fully processed what is going on. Um, and ultimately it regulates itself. It, you know, the hypothalamic pituitary axis has a negative feedback loop so that down regulates itself as the stress goes away. The autonomic nervous system has a second component to it, the parasympathetic nervous system, which sort of relaxes of everything, slows the heart rate down, slows the breathing down, um, diverts the blood away from the muscles and back to, you know, the visceral organs. And then everything kind of goes back to normal. Um, but when this becomes a problem is when there is chronic stress, um, dealing with a chronic illness, dealing with a loved one who has an illness, um, dealing with life, um, you know, all of these things can ultimately lead to dysregulation of this stress response, um, and that can cause a lot of problems. Um, so we know that with chronic stress, uh, when you have chronically high levels of arousal and high levels of stress hormone, it changes how your body regulates different pathways. So it changes your blood sugar metabolism, it changes your lipid metabolism, changes the neurotransmitters that are released in your brain. Um, and this can impact other systems in the body. It impacts cardiovascular system, the immune system, your nervous system, your metabolism. Um, there is research demonstrating that chronic stress can be toxic to the brain. And there have been studies done in both rats and then in humans showing that people under chronic stress, and a lot of this is actually in sort of the trauma literature and early childhood stressors, um, I find that people in these sort of extreme stress conditions have smaller volumes in their hippocampus, which is a structure in the limbic system important for learning and memory. Um, they have a larger volume of the amygdala, that fear center that triggers all of this. Um, and they have a smaller thickness in the prefrontal cortex, which is an area of the brain that's actually involved in sort of top-down regulating the stress response. Um, so I don't have pictures, so we didn't talk about that a few slides ago, but, um, you know, what the prefrontal cortex does is that's an area of the brain involved in emotional regulation. It's involved in, um, sort of calming down your limbic system and regulating your behavior. Um, you can think of it sort of as, you know, if you're walking, on the street at night and you see something move out of the corner of your eye and immediately your body reacts. In my case, I usually think it's a rat, um, but you have that stress reaction. 
And then your brain, like three seconds later, says, oh, it's just a leaf. There's nothing to worry about. You know, that's, that's, and then things calm down. That's um, some of that. Um, so other things that can happen um, with chronic stress, you can have increased risk for anxiety, depression, PTSD, addiction. It can cause physical effects on the body, high blood pressure, weight gain, decreased immune system function. And there have been some studies that suggest that it may accelerate the aging process as well. Um, and we know that the stress response is impacted by multiple factors. So stressors in your adult life, um, a lot of how people respond to that is based on what their childhood experiences were, what their genetics are, what their personality is, what their social network's like. Um, and, you know, a lot of these things are not fully in our control. Um, so that's all I have about stress. I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about um, supportive oncology and mindfulness. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can set up the little wavy hand in Zoom. and um, we can talk about otherwise we'll keep going um okay so the national cancer institute has a definition of supportive care um and this is care that's given to improve the quality of life of people with a serious or life threatening disease with the goal of preventing and treating as early as possible symptoms of that disease side effects caused by treatment of that disease and psychological, social, and spiritual problems that are related to the disease. And I briefly mentioned at the beginning of the talk, but is for people living with brain tumors and their families and caregivers, we actually don't know a lot about what interventions are best um, to reduce um, these symptoms and improve the quality of life for people in this and just to, you know, best help people living with brain tumors. Um, so mindfulness is a type of meditation. This is something I'm very interested in. Um, lots of people are interested in mindfulness for many different things. Um, but it's a meditation that originates from the Buddhist tradition. Um, and the definition that I like the most is one by John Kabat-Zinn, who founded the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program, which is one of the first mindfulness-based stress reduction. It's the first one that was developed. It's a secular program. Um, and it was designed for people living with chronic pain, actually. He defines mindfulness as awareness that arises through paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. And all of those things are sort of key aspects of mindfulness. So there's the awareness, the purposely paying attention to the minute to minute experience, um, and most importantly, without judgment. Um, all right. So, Again, kind of the three key components of mindfulness, there's intention, which directs the focus of the practice. There's attention, which is what you're training through sustained practice of both directing and redirecting attention to various aspects of the present moment. And that can be physical sensations, thoughts, feelings, emotions, um, movement, eating, all different things. And then there's attitude and that this is approached with an attitude of kindness and an attitude of curiosity. Um, some things that mindfulness are not, you hear a lot about mindfulness, you know, focusing really on acceptance and acceptance and non-judgment of a lot of situations. Um, but mindfulness is not pretending that everything is okay. It's not ignoring your feelings. It's not covering up your feelings. Um, it's really being aware of them kind of on a deeper level. Um, sort of the main assumptions of mindfulness are that people are largely unaware of their moment-to-moment -moment experience and they operate on this automatic pilot. Um, but with regular practice, people can develop the capacity to sustain attention to the moment-to-moment -moment experiences that they're having. And this awareness leads to a richer experience of life as a mindful experience 
replaces this unconscious reactiveness to everything going on around us. Um, and this persistent non-judgmental observation of one's thoughts and feelings um, ultimately leads to a more accurate perception of how one responds to both external and internal stimuli, and this can lead to a greater sense of control. So this is sort of the underlying assumptions and basis for mindfulness as an intervention. Um, interestingly, they've done some studies looking at neuroimaging and mindfulness, and they find that the changes in the brain in people who practice practice mindful meditation really are the opposite of changes that you see in chronic stress. So mindfulness has been associated with reduced volume of the amygdala, that fear center, that can become increased in times of chronic stress. And there's also, um, in people who practice mindful meditation, there's an increased thickness in the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex, which are those areas um, involved in learning and memory for the hippocampus and that sort of top-down regulation of this emotional reaction um, process. Just as a disclaimer, the neuroimaging studies, most of them are cross-sectional, meaning they take people who are meditators and people who are not meditators and they look at these differences. So it's not ever entirely clear if meditation causes these changes or if they're just associated with people who meditate. Um, you know, so I wouldn't say it's, it's confirmed or, or anything, but it is very interesting that these same areas that are sort of reduced under chronic stress are actually seem to be bolstered um, in people who practice mindfulness. Um, and mindfulness is thought to counteract the stress response in two ways. So there's that top-down regulation they talked about where you have improved emotional control and improved activation of the prefrontal cortex to regulate that limbic system and regulate those responses. Um, and there's also thought to be some bottom-up regulation by increasing your parasympathetic activity, which sort of reduces that fight or flight response. Um, all right. Um, I thought we could just maybe for a few minutes do a brief mindfulness exercise, just as an example, if you guys are interested in that. Um, so is it well, good? Okay. One, one I thing I'm going to point out is is that yeah. when you start doing it in a group, actually helps. Uh, yeah. I used to have a group that we would have our mindfulness showdown in, in, in laughing. Mm -hmm. Is that we would say the first one to levitate to the ceiling wins. <laughs> so we used to kind of laugh about it, and uh, and I had a group, and we would meditate twice a week. And uh, it's when you sit with someone else, it's easier to do. So that's, that's the end I'm going to say. Is yeah. that, uh, so this exercise may be good because we're doing it together, but I would suggest a lot of you guys get a, you know, someone to meditate with. As crazy as that sounds, mm -hmm. uh, I think that's very helpful. And uh, I've been doing it now for uh, three and a half years. And if I miss a day, I can really tell. So that's it. I'll stop. Yeah, I no, that's very wife. interesting. I have my wife, but I suspect that uh, I get, I get somebody else to would be the best person to meditate with. <laughs> and, 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 and the book is The Art of Living by Thich Nhat Hanh. And that's one of the best books yeah. on mindfulness I've ever read. So, mm -hmm. um, and you can read it in about two or three hours. Yeah, that is a very good book. Um, yes, mindfulness is definitely, I think it can be helpful to do in a group. Um, just a few more comments and then we'll get started on the exercise. But, um, you know, at the beginning when you're first learning, they describe it as this effortful practice. It's not easy. It's actually quite challenging. And then over time that that effort goes down, but they have seen also in these functional neuroimaging studies that when people first start, like there are more areas of the brain that are active because you really have to try um, to meditate and it takes a lot of work. Um, and for some people, actually, it's good to do together because also for some people, um, different 
there was one study that looked at sort of adverse effects of mindfulness meditation and found that in about five to eight percent of people they actually had worsening symptoms like worsening anxiety worsening stress at the beginning because you're focusing on all this stuff you're focusing on your thoughts you're focusing on your feelings you're focusing on your body and that can actually before things um are improved that can make people feel worse um so all right so let's do this brief exercise um so i want you all to find a comfortable position um if you're sitting in a chair sit with your back straight and your feet comfortably on the floor you can also sit on the floor if you're more comfortable doing that or lay down um, but just find a comfortable position. If you are in a place where you feel safe to close your eyes, you can do that. Um, you can rest your hands comfortably on your lap in front of you. And just feel the floor. If you're sitting, feel the floor underneath your feet and feel the chair supporting your weight. And let's start by focusing on the breathing. Um, so we'll take three deep breaths together breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth so breathe in through your nose and now breathe out through your mouth and in and out Now in and out. So now let your breath settle into its own rhythm and just focus on the breath coming in through the nose and out through the nose. It can be helpful to focus on a point where you feel your breath, whether that's at the tip of your nose or in your chest or in your belly and just notice your breath all the way to the top of the inhale and then all the way to the bottom of the exhale and just follow that in and out at your own pace if at any time you notice your mind wandering just return and refocus on your breath And now just return to the room. Start to move your fingers and your toes. And as you feel ready, you can open your eyes. All right. How do you guys feel? How was that for you? How was that experience? But I see lots of I see lots of thumbs, lots of thumbs up. It's wonderful. Uh, or you know, we had another call like this where we did an exercise like this, although it wasn't quite as long. It's really powerful. And I shared before that it is exact. The feeling I get is exactly like going to a Quaker meeting where you spend an hour doing that. Mm. Um, but you're right, Bratton. Being with other people does make it more um, powerful. And uh, I know if any, anyone needs a, a meditation partner, I'm sure you can find some online, um, but you can just always, there's always any Quaker meetings are all on Zoom now. So I'm sure you could find one of those. Other people will talk once in a while. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, and actually that part where I was silent at the end, that was only, it was just shy of two minutes. Um, I don't know if it felt longer or shorter to people, um, but that's about the amount of time it was. It, it definitely um, it felt longer. And, but though, you know what, one thought I had, a distracting thought I had was, I'm going to edit this out of our YouTube video because it's really boring to look at two minutes of right, right. people <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> Although maybe it will help, maybe I'll leave it in. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, there's been a lot of interest in mindfulness-based interventions for people living with cancer. Um, 
it, mindfulness can help strengthen emotion-focused coping, um, which is a term that psychologists use there's sort of two types of coping. There's problem-focused coping and emotion-focused coping. And emotion-focused coping is what you are best, it's, it's best helpful when there are problems that can't be quote-unquote solved. Um, and it can help people become more comfortable with uncertainty. Um, you know, there is one, study that was 23 patients that just completed accrual in Canada looking at mindfulness-based therapy for brain tumor survivors. Doesn't talk about, you know, I don't know what brain tumors were included um, in that, but that just finished accrual in June of last year. So it'll be interesting to see results um, and what they did exactly. Um, and there is at the NIH now a feasibility and preliminary efficacy study um, for mindfulness based intervention for children and young adults and their caregivers um, with high grade or high risk cancer, including brain tumors. Um, but there has not been a lot of work done in this space. And I think some of the challenges are, well, I'd be interested to hear from you some of the challenges but um, that you think, but also, you know, the optimal duration of these sessions, typically this is a long intervention, um, eight weeks, two hours a week with homework 45 minutes a day um, so it can be very time intensive but you know it's not clear that it's possible that there are shorter interventions or shorter sessions that could be just as helpful um, and I do have a survey online looking at um, input from people living with brain tumors and their loved ones um, on how to potentially design a mindfulness intervention intervention in this population. Um, so I can send the link. I've sent the link, I think, already to Martha and Aurelia who posted it for me, but they have that information. I also, in the end of the slideshow, have a QR code, but none of you can see that right now. Um, so if you're interested, feel free to fill that out. Um, and I'll stop there and take whatever questions um, about this or any other topics. Uh, Laura, Laura, could you speak a little bit? Oh, and the the survey. Are you, so you're still taking responses for that? Um, you let yeah, us still taking responses. Okay, it's on the Our Brain Bank website. If you go to Our Brain Bank, that's O U R B R A I N B A N K dot O R G. Click on Stories, and you. Uh, I might have hidden it because I thought it was over, but I'll, I'll unhide it after this meeting. Um, could you talk a little bit about? I know you're planning a um, a study coming up or a trial actually, where you're incorporating the Our Brain Bank app specifically with people with, um, with GBM, right? So could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. And so this is um, something I've been working on now for a couple of years. And the survey is part of this um, to help us design a mindfulness-based intervention for people newly diagnosed with high-grade glioma um, and their caregivers to do a mindfulness-based intervention. Um, my thought is sort of right towards the beginning of diagnosis and set people up with a potential skill set that could be used um, as they go through the disease course. So we would have the intervention and then um, look at outcomes like patient reported outcomes through the Our Brain Bank app, um, also measures of anxiety, depression, and quality of life, um, and see how those change over time. Um, you know, I think mindfulness is an interesting intervention um, for the reasons we talked about. Um, and one of the things that I've always thought would be good to do is, you know, when people are diagnosed with brain tumors, we give you a plan, right? You, you meet with your neuro-oncologist and we talk to you about what the treatment is and how that looks. And, you know, in many cases, if you're not on a clinical trial, it's sort of very regimented. Um, you know, but at least in my experience, um, there hasn't been as much information on what to do if you're struggling or what to do if your coping skills are not, you know, where you'd like them to be. We don't have as much information on on that. So how, how can we develop, you know, information to share with you on what could be helpful um, 
so that you all can live your best life, um, you know, even while you're going through something really challenging. So my thoughts, I'd, I'd be interested for sure. feedback or. Have, have you spoken to, uh, you know, when I was at MD Anderson, I was in a mm -hmm. uh, study and the person's name was Smitha. Golly, she's, she's, she was from India. Uh, have you have you spoken with the folks? Because I was part of a study there. And yeah. Uh, in, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, it's, it's Smitha. I'm I'm gonna get it wrong, but it's and well, uh, and 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 I would go. That they knew I would be willing to do about anything. So I went three days mm -hmm. a week going through chemo and radiation. Oh, interesting. And it really helped um, me sleep. And uh, the only thing I would warn them is that my blood pressure would be like 90 over 40 when I would, mm -hmm. go, I would do it. And then I'll look at each other and go, I don't know if that's okay or not. But, uh, you know, I'd do it. You do some of it in the tree pose, but, you know, since you're balancing, great. You'd hold on to a chair. You do some arm movement. And it really helped me sleep. And I report in. I think it's been really helpful because I think you know the the, the anxiety you need something for your anxiety and it and and one other thing that is true if you starting off by breathing is really the key because you won't be able to jump right into meditation right breathing exercises are a start so that's it I'm sorry no thank you for sharing um I've spoken with and worked a little bit with Terry Armstrong, who was at MD Anderson, now is at the NCI, and she does a lot of work in patient reported outcomes and, and quality of life and, and these studies, but I haven't spoken with the person you worked with directly. I can reach out to her. Yeah, Laura, it's interesting um, what yeah. you're saying about some people actually get stressed out by trying to focus on the breathing, and I have a yeah. friend all her friends are big yoga people. And they said, you have to do it, you have to do it. And she's a very type A, like Harvard educated lawyer in New York City. And she went to one yoga class and she said, I couldn't stand telling people telling me how to breathe. It stressed me out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. There are some people yeah. that have that reaction. Right. And I don't think that any one thing is going to be the answer for everyone. I think it's just finding out what works um, you know, for different people and having options and having multiple resources. Um, that's the best approach. All right. Well, this has been amazing. We're after already over one o'clock here. Um, thank you, Dr. Donovan. This was absolutely incredible and powerful, even though we had a little tech difficulties at the beginning. I, I hope everyone enjoyed it. I think this is the most people we've ever had on one of these calls. So you should consider that a, a compliment to you. Um, so everyone who's new, uh, look up our brain bank. That's um, our brain bank, O-U-R-B-R-A-I-N-B-A-N-K. We have a study for people living with GBM and their care partners. You can join just using a smartphone. And uh, we have these calls at the second Tuesday of every month. So please join us again. Some will be free form. Some will have special guests. Actually, I think our next one, actually, no, not, yes, in October, will be an amazing um, young woman that I just met on Instagram recently. And she doesn't have GBM herself, but she has AA, which can often, sadly, turn into GBM. Mm -hmm. And she, um, she's a doctor herself. She's 30 years old. And she is writing a book. And she's just got an amazing, she's funny. She's inspirational. She's, you know, iconoclastic. She's uh, really kind of radical, I think. So I hope um, join us next month for the second Tuesday in October. If you want to get calendar invitations for these chats, you can email us at info at ourbrainbank.org or um, you can write me, Martha, at ourbrainbank.org and we'll send you a calendar invite. And um, join us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, we started, we had our college interns do a TikTok channel, but I haven't actually looked at that yet. So I don't know, I don't know if that's actually happening, but if anyone is a TikTok expert, you can want to volunteer, <laughs> let us know. 
so thank you again, Dr. Donovan. This was um, really powerful and um, everyone take, I sent in the chat, I think sent the survey, the link to the survey um, on our website. So you can take that and um, we'll see you again in one month from now. So everyone be well, get, to, get out, so get a little sunshine. This is my personal meditation practice. I go out, I sit in the sun and I just do really simple arm movements like this and with my breathing. And it, I spend five minutes doing that and my cough goes away. It's, it's, it's like magic. <laughs> okay, anyone else wanna say any last words? Thank you all for your patience with me. <laughs> I, I just wanted to know if she had any apps that she recommended for Oh, yes. Yeah. That's what I was Yeah, in. there, yep. So there's um, a couple of different apps that are out there, and I think you can find the one that works best for you. Mm -hmm. There is um, probably the most widely known is a Headspace app. Um, my favorite is actually something called Calm, mm -hmm. C-A-L-M. Mm -hmm. um, that's the one that I use. I think it has a lot of good guided meditations and it has some series of meditations mm -hmm. um, that you can focus on. So I like that one the most, um, but also Headspace. And then some people use something called Insight Timer. Um, that might be more if you do more meditation. Um, that one I learned about at the, I did a mindfulness-based stress reduction course um, about two years ago, and that was recommended in that course. Mm -hmm. um, but I think to start either the Calm app or, or Headspace. Perfect. Um, thank you. So. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it was really wonderful to be here. And they have my contact information. So if there's any questions, feel free to reach out directly. Great. Okay. Thank you again. And um, uh, everyone, so join us next month. Okay. Bye, everybody. Jazz hands. Okay. Bye. <laughs>